All right, students, here we are, hyperpituitarism number four. Nursing care. Nursing care of the patient, basically, who's had pituitary gland surgery. Um, what we have here, two things can occur in pituitary surgery. One is removal of the tumor or the adenoma. Remember we said that when a patient has hyperpituitarism, it is most often caused by an adenoma. An adenoma can be a micro, less than 10 millimeters, or macro adenoma, greater than 10 millimeters. Now, since the adenoma is the genesis, the cause of the hypersecretion of growth hormone and prolactin, if we can deal with the problem with the adenoma, hence, we won't have the oversecretion and the problems of hyperpituitarism. All right, another option is complete removal of the pituitary gland. When we remove the pituitary gland altogether, we the patient will end up on permanent, or for life, exogenous hormone replacement therapy. Remember that the pituitary gland, in essence, controls the release of the glucocorticoids from the adrenal gland. So the patient's gonna be dependent on exogenous cortisol. The patient um, will need a thyroid replacement therapy, and also antidiuretic hormone, which comes from the pituitary gland. All right, so, when we remove the whole pituitary gland, the patient will be subject to exogenous hormone replacement therapy for life. All right, now let's get to some general considerations that involve the patient with the transphenoidal hypophysectomy. The transphenoidal, transphenoidal hypophysectomy is the most common of the pituitary surgeries. And what it involves is we have um, the one option is to either go through the nose, through the sphenoid sinus, through the meninges, to the pituitary gland. Another book was explaining that basically go through the, the upper gums, uh, through the um, sphenoid sinus, to the pituitary gland. Either or, both of these procedures are going through the meninges. Okay? And um, there's going to be some concerns with that. Um, Post-op concerns, neuro checks, level of consciousness. Neuro checks, very important. What we concern ourselves with when we go into the cranial vault, that the patient could have intracranial pressure. Maybe there's some bleeding within the cranial vault. All right, maybe there's some bleeding or some other maladies that are occurring there and the patient has increasing intracranial pressure which can easily uh, reap havoc in the patient's life and even bring about death. So we need to be careful that the patient doesn't have increasing intracranial pressure. The best indicator for that is level of consciousness. If the patient's alert, that's a clear indication that we're not having a problem with intracranial pressure. So, but on the other hand, if we start to see a decrease in alertness, that's the first sign and the early sign of intracranial pressure. Delayed pupillary response. Uh, asymmetric muscle strength. What that basically means, well, let's use the term hemoparesis. It means weakness on one side of the body. Muscle weakness. Okay, that would be caused, in this case, by some problem in the brain. Intracranial pressure. Other things, vision. Check the vision. Perla. Remember what perla is? Pupils equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation. Meningitis, that's a big concern with this. Anytime you penetrate the meninges, hello, you can have some concerns about the chances of meningitis. A couple signs and symptoms of meningitis could be nuchal rigidity, which basically means stiff neck. Also, the classic signs of meningeal irritation is Koenig and Brzezinski. Koenig sign is when you um, flex the hip and try and extend the lower leg. When you do that, you incur pain, uh, you, you incur leg pain. Brzezinski is a little different. With Brzezinski, you tilt your head forward onto your chest, and when you do, both your hips flex. That's Koenig and Brzezinski signs. Um, they also, the patient may also have uh, photosensitivity, sensitivity to light, headache, and other factors as well. Another thing that we need to consider ourselves post-op transphenoidal hypophysectomy is uh, water balance. So what we have to do is strict INO. Really, when we say strict INO, we mean strict INO, intake and output. 
Why do we have to do that? Well, we tinkered with the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is what works in order um, with antidiuretic hormone to keep water balanced. Antidiuretic hormone protects us from losing too much fluid. Okay, it conserves the fluid in our body. What we'll be doing is checking for signs and symptoms of dehydration and fluid overload. And we want to check the urine for specific gravity. Might as well get used to these numbers. 1.010 and 1.025. There and abouts is the normal range for specific gravity. Now, if you went down to 1.005 as an example, that would be a very dilute urine. And that might be a sign that you have diabetes insipidus, which basically means you don't have enough antidiuretic hormone. On the other side of the coin, you might have greater than 1.025, you might have 1.030, which would mean that your blood is rather thick. And what it might mean is you have too much antidiuretic hormone. All right, now, Another concern is prevent the dislodgement of the meningeal fat pad. What are you talking about? Well, remember, uh, when they did the surgery, they put the device through the sphenoidal sinus, through the meninges, to the pituitary gland. So when they come out, naturally there'll be a hole. And if there's a hole there, what will leak out? You guessed it right, cerebral spinal fluid. If that is the case, what we need to do but what the surgeon does is they put a little patch to prevent the leak. And we get the patch from the abdomen, a piece of tissue from the abdomen, and then they cover the meninges so the cerebral spinal fluid does not, what, leak. But we need to cooperate and we need to consider that that little fat pad is fragile. Easy can pop out. So we want to avoid pressure. So how do we do this? Avoid anything that has to do with the Valsalva maneuver. So no straining. What does that mean? Well, let's use some stool softener so they don't have to strain for a bowel movement. How about coughing? That's right, no coughing. What about sneezing? We want to avoid sneezing, lifting heavy objects for at least three months, or no bending down, three months, two to three months. Even no brushing teeth. No teeth brushing. Uh, one book, uh, one, uh, one source was saying for two weeks. And this again is to prevent dislodgement of the what? Meningeal fat pad. Another concern that we're going to have is with cerebral spinal fluid leakage. Cerebral spinal fluid leakage. And this obviously is a concern. Now that patch that they put during surgery can pop off. But sometimes a little bit does leak out. Usually this is self-limiting, and what we mean by self-limiting is that within 72 hours, it just fixes itself and the drainage is gone. What would the drainage be like if it was there? Well, it's clear, cerebral spinal fluid is clear, colorless, um, has some protein in there, but one giant thing to consider, it has glucose. So you think, well, gee, if there is some fluid there, why don't we just test it for glucose right there at the bedside? Well, nurses used to do that in the past. That was the intervention. Nowadays, that's out, and sending the specimen to the lab to have it evaluated is in. Either or, if you suspect cerebral spinal fluid leakage, you need to notify the doctor. One of the nursing interventions will be keep the head of the bed elevated. Real quick, I just want to go over some of the nursing diagnosis. Anxiety, disturbed sensory perception, visual, acute pain, impaired oral mucous membrane, risk for infection. Now when we talk about risk for infection, I want you to focus in on the issue of meningitis. Meningitis. And here again, we mentioned it earlier, nuchal rigidity. We mentioned here risk for, um, risk for fluid, volume, either excess or deficiency related to ADH impairment. Remember the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland and that the hypothalamus has osmoreceptors and is carefully watching the osmolality of the blood and if need be will cause the pituitary gland to secrete ADH to keep the fluid levels at balance. But if you tinker with the pituitary gland in surgery, all bets are off and you could have a problem.
Anyways, there's a lot more to say. Thank you.